Praise the Lord. We'll rise up as we pray together. A great God in heaven, we thank you at this time for our Bible study. Thank you, Lord, because we know you're always present with us whenever we come together. So we can study in your presence. Lord, we're praying today that your word will enrich our lives once again in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you'll take these words, make them very plain, very clear, applicable to every life, every family, and the whole church in Jesus' name. Bless your people today. Help us, Lord, to accept everything you are teaching us and to put practical application to the word. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you very much. You can see now. Welcome to Matthew chapter 5. Now it may surprise you that we're now in the third week. Studying almost the same thing. But from different perspectives. Because today, we're still looking at Matthew chapter 5 from verse 43. I'm reading to you from verse 43. Ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, but... I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Many years ago when I was in school, we noticed something about some of our teachers. If something was very likely to come out at the final exam, the teacher will come to the class and teach. And if it's a loving teacher, a teacher that did not want us to fail our exam, he'll come begin and teach it all over again. And then some of us who thought were bright will be almost grumbling, saying, What's the matter with the teacher? Maybe he's not well prepared. That's why he comes to teach the same thing again. And then, you know, I remember this ex especially at the third, at the final exam at the university. And the teacher came again and taught exactly the same thing. Then I began to reason within myself, this is likely to come out in the exam. And this is likely to be a compulsory question that you cannot avoid. And true to the fact, we got to the exam hall. In fact, some of the other students, you know, they were careless about it. They felt this man just repeating something over and over. Maybe he didn't have time to prepare. But I remember myself and another student. We just knew because of the emphasis and the overemphasis on this thing that the teacher was teaching, we knew it would come out. And then it came out. I want to tell you, I still remember, although it's now 40 years ago, 1967, I took a whole booklet to answer that one single question. Because the scene was very long. And then my partner, he did the same thing. All the rest of the class couldn't make head or tail because they thought the teacher was wasting her time. I have a feeling that this that we're studying will come out in the final exam. When you meet the Lord face to face, yes, he'll ask you about this doctrine and this doctrine and that doctrine. But this one that is coming up over and over and over again, you better watch it because it's coming out in the final exam. Whatever doctrines you believe, Whatever work you do, wherever you have been, whatever sacrifices you have made, this is one question that is sure to come out in that final exam. How did you relate with your enemy? How did you act to your enemy? What response did you show to your enemy? Because Jesus said, you heard what they said. You love your neighbors and hate your enemies, but I say unto you that you love your enemies enemies. Actually, you see, these teachers, they had corrupted the word of God. 
They didn't understand the word. They didn't understand what they were reading in the Old Testament. Look at Leviticus, for example. We're reading from chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 18. Here it says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Even in your heart, you will not hate your brother. There will not be any ill feeling, bad feeling, hatred in your emotion, in your feeling towards your brother. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. Do you understand? Rebuking your neighbor is not hatred, it's love. Oh, my brother, that thing you did is not all right. That's love. Don't repeat that again. That's love. You will hurt yourself and hurt your eternity if you do that again. That's love. Rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. That's verse 17, verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. He's saying you will do this not because of the law of Moses, but because I am the Lord. You will love your neighbor as yourself. Not because you are in the Old Testament or you are in the New Testament. Not because you are in another dispensation or you are in this other age, but because I am the Lord. And as long as the Lord is still the Lord, here is the commandment of the Lord. You will love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, in that same chapter, in verse 34, that is chapter 19 of Leviticus, verse 34, it says, But the stranger that dwelleth with you, shall be unto you as one born among you and thou shalt love him as thyself that means he may not be from your tribe he might be a total stranger it's not a relative it's not even a christian brother and it's not somebody that shares the same conviction with you a total stranger it says you will love him as yourself for ye was strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Again, it says the reason you will do this is not because of him, whether it's good or bad, but because I am the Lord your God. And therefore you understand then your relationship with your brother, your relationship with your sister, your relationship with your neighbor, your relationship with the strangers, and your relationship with enemies is determined by who the Lord is, and what the Lord has said, not what they do, not how they act, not what they throw at you, not what they do to you. But because I am the Lord your God, because you belong to me. And this is the attitude that a child of God ought to have. That's why you have that attitude. In fact, uh, those uh, people, they knew they knew only they were pretending because one of those uh, leaders uh, they, they sent somebody or maybe the person came himself and then was asking the Lord what shall I do to inherit eternal life think about that eternal life the man was thinking about the future about heaven about the kingdom of God about inheriting life eternal and he said what shall I do and the Lord Jesus wanted to know what he knew before he will tell him if there's any other extra thing. And he said, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And the man replied and said, thou shalt love thy, the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He got it right. But you know, having it in the head is one thing. Having it in the life is another thing entirely. Being able to quote it from the Bible, that's one thing. Being able to live it out when the challenge comes, that's another thing. Being able to recite the scripture, memory verse, that shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself, and close your eyes and recite it, that is one thing, but to do it when you get to your neighborhood to do it when somebody steps on your toes 
to do it when somebody cheats you to do it when somebody hurts you to do it when somebody is planning to harm you that's another thing and so the lord said all right go and do that then the fellow wanted to know but who is my neighbor that's why jesus gave the parable of the good samaritan and then after that he said go and do that you see the multitudes who gathered before jesus christ to learn from him were very much ignorant of god's standard and divine requirement of love they knew the word love just as they knew the word righteousness but you know just knowing a word is not enough if you ask the pharisees for example have you heard about righteousness oh yes they said that, that that's our trade that's what we do we are righteous through and through we're not like these publicans they thought the new righteousness until jesus came and said except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of god and if you ask the average person do you know about love or the say of course they sing about that over the radio they write each in the newspapers in the village they talk about each there are even some stories some moonlight stories about love literature books carry that you will know about love but the lord is telling us except your love shall exceed the love of the scribes and pharisees ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of god you see the righteousness of the pharisees it was self-centeredness self-righteousness and the same thing with their love their love was self-love you will love your neighbor they didn't put us thyself they cut that off and then he joined another thing they said and then you will hate your enemy and the lord needed to correct that and we have studied it two weeks already but since we have been studying it for these two weeks now have you reconciled with your enemies have you blessed them that hurt you have you prayed for them that despitefully use you have you started doing good to the people that you know you had some things against them or are you still the same no wonder the lord is telling us study that again last week we learned we said surprise your enemies and think of something use your imagination and use your mind what can i do to surprise my enemy this man that has thrown something at me and he wanted me to fall what can i do to lift him up to help him and to promote him and to make him have progress surprise your enemies that's what we learned last week how many of us have carried that out that's what the lord is telling us again look at this again let's see it matthew chapter 5 we're reading from verse 43 ye have heard that it had been said thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy but i say unto you love your enemies number one we learn the christian life is not a kind of um, isolated life there are some people they think if you are going to be holy you stay by yourself don't talk to anybody don't interact with anybody because you know they say interacting with people can make you sin relating with people can make you forget yourself so so as not to sin and so as to live a righteous life and live a life that you'll go to heaven just lock up yourself inside your room eat alone talk alone pray alone do all your things alone and spend your time and your life alone because this world is so bad that's why we have grace the grace is to make us come out of the house come out of the room and mix with the people the people that are injurious and the people that are hurtful and the people that are bad and the people that are going to try to 
destroy you, mix with them, and then let the love of God come out through you, and then they will know this is grace. There's no holiness in just hiding yourself in a cave. There's no holiness in just walking alone, a lone ranger. You're not mixed with anybody, not talk to anybody. How are we going to know that you are righteous? Nobody ever come in, comes in contact with you. You never come in contact with anybody. Nobody ever hurts you. And you never hurt anybody. And you are just all alone. How do you know a man like that is righteous? It's when we push you and you smile. And then you come back again and say, How about that place you wanted to go? Can we go there now? Then we know you have something in you. That's why Jesus is saying, Come out. And express yourself and live a life that is free, a life that is in fellowship, a life that is friendly, a life that is touching the lives of other people. Forget the hurts of yesterday and forget the hurts of last year, it's gone. And then live a life today that we know this is a child of God. You're not carrying hearts about like you're carrying a load of cement at your back. That's heavy. You'll not be able to make progress. This one has done something, you put it in the heart. That one has done something, you put it in the heart. The time you should spend planning to, for progress and planning to live a happy, joyful life, you'll be planning it to see how I'm going to retaliate. It's a waste of life. That's why Jesus is saying, this is the life to live, to love your enemies, that he may be the children of your father which is in heaven, because he makes his reign to come upon the good and the evil, and his son to rise upon the just and the unjust. It says in verse 46, for if you love them which love you, what reward of you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, your brethren only, those who speak your language only, those who understand you only, those who help you only, if those are the people you mix with, and then you don't feel convenient in any other society, what have ye more than others? Do not ye even the public and so be ye therefore perfect. Even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. What the Lord is saying is, the father is waiting for you to resemble him. To look like him. To act like him. To behave like him. To just love his creatures. Because it's your father that created them. That's what we're looking at today. Christ's command to love like God. We shall do it. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, perversion of love by the clerics. Clerics are the religious leaders. Clerics, they are the people that put themselves on the seat in Moses' seat. The clerics. But the perversion of love by them. Number two, perception of love by Christ. How does Christ see love? How does he explain love? What does he ex expect that love will do when we come to relate with people? Perception of love by Christ. Number three, perfection of love in Christians. Let's come to this chapter 5, verse 43. By the time we get through this, you'll preach it yourself. I said you'll preach it yourself. And you know something is good to preach and you should go out and preach because you see when you preach as you preach and other people they begin to obey and they come to tell you they say well they'll call you pastor how many of you are pastors sir god bless you if you are not one god will make you one and then they'll say pastor you see that thing you preached in the boss that thing you said that this and this, i didn't know i could do it 
But when you're preaching, I was wondering what kind of preacher is this? And then I began to pray and the Lord gave me grace. And somebody who had not been greeting me for more than six months, I just went back home after God touched my heart and I greeted him. I knelt down before him. Everything was all right. And you, the preacher, you remember? Ah, look at this man. A new convert. But um, the one that preached to him I had something with my whatever about two months ago and that thing is still hot inside my stomach. And then you go back quickly so that your converts will not go ahead of you. I said your converse will not go ahead of you. So what your converse are doing, you too, by the grace of God, you'll be able to do in Jesus' name. He said, ye have heard that it had been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's what the clerics said. What the religious leaders said. What those people that sat in Moses' seat, that's what they said. But as always, those false teachers, they had perverted and corrupted God's message to his people. And the perversion is in two ways. Number one, there is an addition. Number two, there is an omission. An addition as well as omission. What's the addition? And hate thine enemy. That's the addition. What's the omission? As thyself. They removed as thyself. I see that's what Satan always does. Satan will take a little scripture, he will remove something and add something, it will still have a little of scripture there. Then that will not make you to discover the deception immediately. Their message was lifted from God's word. It contains something from God's revealed truth. Yet, there was a great departure from the truth, a great departure from divine revelation. A little truth with a lot of lies are actually very deceptive because it becomes almost believable and then damns the soul. And multitudes who are ignorant of the truth, they go astray. But before I go to all the references you have there, why did these people, why did they say what they said? What made them to feel that they could be justified in hating their enemies. Now you see this is what they have done in all the other scriptures. You know when we studied uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, that's in the scripture. But you see I told you at that time, that's for the church. That's for the magistrate. But they took it out of the court and they brought it to the home. And it became personal. That's why it is wrong. Now these enemies we are talking about. There are many kinds of enemies and jesus christ is talking here now in chapter in chapter 5 about your enemies it says love your enemies you say are there other kinds of enemies of course number one there are enemies of god they're not your enemies they're just enemies of god and it's between them and god not between you and them Number two, there are enemies of the nation. And the nation would normally take those criminals, enemies of the nation. Have you heard about people that have, they do serial killing? They go here, kill, go there, kill, and they're just going all about. And they're enemies to the nation, to the existence, the integrity, the dignity, the security, the safety in that nation. Those are enemies of the nation. And then there are enemies of the cross of Christ. They're not, it's not that they are persecuting you or hating you in particular. They just hate Christ. And they hate Christianity. Those are enemies of the cross. That has nothing to do with you. And let me show you in the scriptures. In First in Kings chapter 21. First Kings chapter 21. We're looking at verse 20. 1 Kings 21, verse 20. And he hath said unto Elijah, As thou found me, O mine enemy, see that. But what's, uh, what's Elijah doing with Ahab? That Elijah will be an enemy to Ahab. There's no personal relationship between Elijah and Ahab. The only thing that concerned Elijah as a prophet of God is that Ahab had brought idolatry into the whole nation. 
And he had brought all these prophets of Baal. And the Almighty God sent Elijah to Ahab and said, Go and tell him, You have killed Naboth and you have taken the vineyard. I'm going to send judgment on you. And Elijah, Elijah was not a personal enemy. You see, that's the mistake people make. And you say, have counted him as a personal enemy. No, Ahab was an enemy of God. Look at Second, Second Samuel chapter twelve. Second Samuel chapter twelve. We're looking at verse fourteen. Twelve fourteen. How be it? Because by this deed thou was giving great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Enemies of the Lord. This is what Nathan was telling David. He said, David, you know what you've done? The enemies of God, they have been waiting to look for a loophole that the believers and the unbelievers are the same. Nobody can live a righteous life. See what you have done. Now you have given occasion, opportunity, liberty to those enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. That tells you then, these are enemies of God. Nathan was not an enemy to David. God sent him and said, this is what you do. It's like, for example, when a, a criminal is brought to the court and a magistrate is sitting on the bench and he looks at the case and then the magistrate says, now because of what you have done, you're going to go to the prison for about three years. And then the man, the criminal is telling the judge, is saying, how is it you became my enemy? Why are you doing this to me? It's not an enemy. Is standing in for the nation and this criminal is an enemy of the nation you must make a difference between an enemy of the nation an enemy of the lord and then a personal enemy what we're dealing with is a personal enemy love your enemies that is the people that relate with you and they do things that hurt you. Those are your own personal enemies. That's what we're studying about in Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I'm reading to you from verse 6. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was by Jesus which was the deputy of the country, such as Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul, and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, was to them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. And Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. See that? Paul had never met him. There wasn't any personal relationship. But you see, the man was trying to turn the deputy away from salvation. Didn't want the deputy to make a decision for Christ and be able to get to heaven. And so Paul realized because he was filled with the Holy Ghost And he said, church of the devil, enemy of righteousness And so then you understand, whatever Paul said now You will not say, oh, well, look at Paul, a great apostle He did not love his enemy And Jesus said, love your enemies No, this man, this, he wasn't a personal enemy to Saul or to Paul Look at it now and will not thou cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord and now behold the hand of the Lord is upon thee thou shalt be blind not seeing the sun for a season and immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand then the deputy when he saw when he saw what was done believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And so you will see then when we're talking about enemies, we're not talking about all the general, general enemies. You know, the people that are criminals and the people that hate the nation and the people that hate sound doctrine. 
and the people that you know want to destabilize uh, you know the Christian faith we are not talking about that those are not our personal enemies we're talking about your enemies now we come to Matthew chapter 5 now that you understand the kind of enemies we're dealing with so there's no confusion it says in chapter uh, chapter 5 verse 43 ye have heard that it has been said thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy they didn't read the old testament all right let us look at deuteronomy chapter 22 and see what they were told in the old testament what their attitude ought to be to their enemies personal enemies in Deuteronomy chapter 22 i'm reading from verse 1 Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his, or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. If thy brother be not nice unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring each into thine own house. It shall be with thee until thy brother seek it. And thou shalt restore e to him again. In like manner shalt thou deal with his ass, so shalt thou deal with his raiment. And with all that all, all lost things of thy brothers which he shall which he has lost, and thou hast found, shalt thou do likewise, thou mayest not hide thyself. Now join that with Exodus chapter twenty three. You've seen what you have to do to your neighbor to your brother to the one that you know is quite near to you or maybe to a stranger because you he says uh, you might even not know him but you you've discovered that ass or property belonging to that neighbor but look at chapter 23 of exodus verse 4 if thou meet thine enemy's ox enemy's ox old testament or his ass going astray Thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. You see that? That's the Old Testament. Why is it that these Pharisees, they only read one part of a verse and they'll never read the next, the next part of the verse? They read whichever one they wanted to read. And they will not read the other part they don't want to read. It's like, you know, some religious people of today. You know what they do? they will read some psalms they don't understand some of those psalms as a messianic psalms and some of those six are actually predicting what judas is going to do if you read psalm 22 they pierce my hand they pierce my feet it's talking about christ they parted my garments and they're like dogs barking at me and, it, and then you know when you read Jeremiah they sold me for 30 pieces of silver some of those psalms are actually talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and then the curse that will come upon these ones that the psalmist spoke about and they will not read where David said when my enemies were sick I afflicted myself with fasting as if they were the children of my mother that one they will not read it's the other side where david put a curse on those other enemies actually the enemies of the messiah that's the one they're going to read and they will think david was causing his own enemies and so they will say now you see we're justified in causing our enemies but no read the scriptures aright god will deliver us proverbs chapter 24 in Proverbs chapter 24, we're reading from verse 17. Rejoice not when thine enemy falls. Old Testament, Old Testament. If your enemy's business falls, never rejoice. Never. If your enemy has fallen sick, he has fallen into sickness, never, never rejoice. If he has fallen into the hands of wicked people, never rejoice. Don't go about sin, you see. He's got it. He hated me. That's what he planned for me. It has come on his head now. Even in the Old Testament, it says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falls. 
Let not thine heart be glad when it stumbles. Let not your heart even be glad at all when it stumbles. Let the Lord see it and it displease him. And he turn away his wrath from him. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 21. If thine enemy be hungry, do what? Give him bread to eat. Give him bread to eat. It is, you know, this takes a conversion. The natural man cannot do this. The natural man cannot, you can tell. You're living in the same house with somebody. And because, not even an enemy, but because maybe he didn't uh, greet you or didn't do something, you're cooking in the kitchen together. And the fellow said, oh, uh, please, madam, can you give me some salt there? <laughs> salt? You have mouth asking for salt from me? Now you know I have salt. And then you face me asking for salt. You remember yesterday? I thought you went to Bible study. I thought you learned that whatever they have said and whatever they have done, that we should just love them and forget about yesterday. Salt. Are you the one that created the salt? Is the Almighty God that created it? Water? Are you the one that created the ocean? Isn't it out of the gift of God? You've got some water. Even the food you have, the crop, who made it to grow? Was it not, is it not God? What have you that you created yourself? that you brought up yourself even the knowledge you have the ability you have is it not from God and if God has so blessed you above the other fellow and your enemy comes to need something and your enemy for once knows you have something he doesn't have and your enemy knows you can do something he cannot do and he's, he's humiliated he's humbled and he bends low before you say Please, can you give me this with all joy? God has promoted you. And God has made you to know that even your enemy can depend on you for livelihood. That's why the Lord is saying, you forget all these little, little things people have done. And then it says, when your enemy is hungry, you give him bread to eat. If he starts to give him water to drink, we will do it. Uh, you've had the story of, of, of David. We don't need to, you know, repeat that over and over. How Saul hated him. And Saul wanted to kill him. And the Lord had appointed him that he would be a king after Saul. And then he, he was driven to the, to the wilderness. As uh, one of the days now, Saul was sleeping. Sleeping so deeply. And all the summer bearers and bodyguards, they were all asleep. It was a sleep from one high from above. And then, but that sleep is a test for David. A test for David. Because God had appointed him to the throne. And God wanted to know, I said I found a man that will fulfill all my will. I'm going to see whether this man will fulfill my will. And he brought David there. And David saw Saul sleeping. All the armor bearers bodyguards sleeping. And then one of the servants and the uh, assistants of David said, David, this is the day. We're going to finish our suffering today. No more suffering. This is the only enemy we have on earth. The whole of the nation, they're looking up to us. They love us. They love you. If we kill this man here, it's finished. And David said, please don't do that. Is the anointed of the Lord. His day will come. God will deal with him himself. He cut off a little part of his clothes. Just to evidence. To show that Saul I was there. Then he went to a far place. And he shouted. He said my, my Lord. My Lord. My father. He didn't call him my enemy. They may call you enemy. Don't call them enemy. Friend how are you? neighbor how are you doing today madam so and so everything is all right don't call them enemies and then Saul at the voice he said is that 
your voice, my son? Yes, I am. What have I done that were chasing me about? As if I'm just, you know, like an animal. Why all this? I've been there. Look at the part of your cloth I caught. And look at the bottle of water I took. Send your servants to come and carry it from me. And then he said, go back home. You are more righteous than I. That is better than you taking loss into your hand and then destroying other people. You will not do that again. In Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. We're reading from verse 14. Amos chapter 5. Reading from verse 14. See good and not evil, that she may live. So the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as he has spoken. Hate the evil, love the good. Now, hate the evil. We hate the evil character of our enemies. We don't love what they do. We don't love the harm they cause us. We don't enjoy the pain they inflict on us. We hate the evil, but we love the evil doer. Not because of what he has done, but because of Christ. Because Christ wants us to love him. So that we can pray for him, and we can think about his salvation. And then when he gets converted, we have won his soul into the kingdom of God. That's what the Lord wants us to do. And as we do that, great will be our reward. In point number two, perception of love by Christ. Perception of love by Christ. Matthew chapter 5 verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. By the way, that's a command. That's an imperative. It's not a suggestion. And this love is from the will. It's not emotional. You know, there are times you don't feel like doing something. It's like, you know, sometimes a mother, a nursing mother is sick and weak. But she has uh, a baby that she is nursing. And a mother, the nursing mother, because of her weakness and sickness, she, she actually needs a lot of rest. And then at night, the baby wakes up and starts crying. And the mother, in her weakness and in pain or evil sickness, will get up and take care of that child. She does that by the will, not by emotion, not by feeling. There are some things you don't feel like doing. But you have to do it because of love. Love your enemies. You will not feel like it. Just, just do it. Just do it. Wake up yourself. Speak to your soul. Speak to your spirit. Speak to the inner man. And say, inner man, get up. Love this enemy. Love this person. And maybe your inner man is whispering, I don't like to do it. It's not convenient. Don't wait for convenience. Your Lord commands you. Christ commands you. And then everything you have within you, all the courage and all the will, determination you can muster from within, you will love. And then you say, but what will I do? Then you begin to use your brain. Use your eyes. Use your observation. What does my enemy need? Yeah, I mean, looking at him. Although he looks strong and, you know, he's bragging all about. But he needs this, he needs this. Use your imagination. And then you, you get sacrificially. Get some things and give to him. Sacrifice part of your time to help him sacrifice part of your property what you have to help him to lift him up and then he'll be wondering now it may not change him immediately he may just think that you're trying to buy favor he may misunderstand you he may even be talking to other people he might say you know mr so-and-so he will not call you brother since he's not a christian mr so-and-so fears me now that's why, with all that I did to him last month, you know, he just, I just came back from the office. I said, oh, welcome. And then he gave me something. I just, I got it from him. 
Because, you know, he's, uh, he's not afraid of me. He's trying to buy my favor. That's what they will think. But don't worry about what they think. You're obeying the Lord. And that's what is important. Might even, you know, speak back to you and say, oh, you think that this one will change me? No, I cannot change anybody. I'm not trying to change you. And then they will repeat the same thing. When they repeat the same thing, you also repeat your love. And when they repeat the hatred, then you repeat the love again. Then they will realize, it's like this man is not trying to buy any favor. He's not seeking for anything. He's just obeying his Lord. If we will do this, number one, we will show that we're children of God. Number two, we will show that we have the grace that they don't have. Number three, that grace will attract them to Christ. And then they'll become born again. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You see the way Jesus said it. But I say unto you, what an authority. The emphasis is not only on what he said, but on who said it. It was not just his teaching that, that was a standard of truth. He himself was a personification of the truth, the standard of truth. God's love sent him to save the world. His love brought him to redeem humanity. He was not just the word personified. He was love in person. He came. He was full of pure love, divine love, infinite love. His love overleaped all the boundaries of race, nationality, age, culture, and tribe. He had all the authority to say faithfully and forcefully, love your enemies. And now he has commanded us. And some people say, but it's impossible. But can't you think, how can the almighty God, how can Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, he is full of love, how can he tell us to do something that is impossible? He will make it possible. Because you see, when he enters into us, it's no longer I that lives, but Christ liveth in me. What we do now is no more us. It's Christ that lives in us. And once we allow Christ to live big within us, he will do it. Genuine love for our enemies is one of the evidences that we are really truly converted and really saved. Lack of love for our enemies is a great warning sign that our profession is not complete yet. That we need to, be, to plead with God to give us more grace, more grace. That the grace now will show that we are really born again. We are really children of God. In Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 27 and verse 28. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. Then in verse 32, For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye, love, if, if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. If ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what have you, what thank have you? For sinners also learn to sinners to receive as much again. It's saying that we can even learn to them. You will not, not say, no, I don't have anything to do with them. And you know, sometimes, uh, unfortunately, when we were very young, our parents, they, they taught, uh, you know, the children, if, uh, the, if uh, the man is not in good terms with the father Then the father will tell his children Don't be in good terms with the children of so and so And he planted hatred In the hearts of their children We shouldn't do that We shouldn't even hate anybody Neither should we let our children know That that man is our enemy and then we are sending our children to also hate his own children. Christians will never do that. We should never do that. 
It says, we're just to love. In verse 35, but love your enemies. Do, do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. You see, when you, when you love your enemies, hoping for nothing again. That's it. This is the mistake we make. And we, we want to, okay, I'm going to obey the Lord. At least if I obey the Lord, who knows? The man will change and, start, and stop troubling me. Therefore, we are not obeying because we are seeking for the glory of God. We are obeying because we want to stop our pain, our problem. That if I do this, the man will leave me alone. If I lend him money, if I give him food, if I give him water, if I help his children, if I do this and do that for him, then life will become easier for me. That's selfish. We are not doing it for it's so that life will become easier for us. We're doing it because this is the will of God. Whether they repay us good or evil, that doesn't matter. That's not the end, that's not the end result. The end result is thy will be done in earth as it is done in heaven. This is what you want us to do. And we're going to do it because it's your will. We leave the result in your hand. And then it says... And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your father also is merciful. Can that be done? I said, can we do it? We will by the grace of God. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're reading from verse 14. Romans 12, verse 14. Rejoice, uh, uh, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Bless and curse not. Never allow those words to come out of your mouth. Not even when, you know, you're, you're going through pain. You're going through some harassments. You're going through some inconveniences. Never allow those words to come out of your mouth. The devil will formulate those words. The devil might give those thoughts. That's temptation. The devil might say, you're not going to allow this to go like that, will you? You're not going to allow this woman to go scot-free like this, and then you act like a fool. Are you going to do this? You're not, going to, you're not going to allow this rat, this little one, to insult you like this and get away with it. Who do you think they'll make you of? That's what the devil will say. But it's temptation. Don't yield to temptation. Don't yield to that. And then you'll just say, no, I'm going to bless. I will not curse. In verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Recompense to no man, whatever the man may be. Whatever the man might have done. Whatever you might hear that the man is planning to do. You know, some people bring stories to us. Unnecessary stories. Uh, what, why don't you tell them to just, you know, keep their stories to themselves. That you've made up their, your mind that even if they did more than what they are telling you, you are going to love them all the same. Let them keep those stories to themselves. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. No more. Avenge not yourselves. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, what does it say? Give him drink now. We're going to look at another thing. If he thirst, give him drink. Have you noticed in all this that we're talking about? What Jesus said, this is your enemy. If he's hungry, give him food. That's material thing. If he's thirsty, give him water. That's just tough food. If he needs money, lend him. That's just material things there are things you cannot give your enemy there are things you cannot say okay because Jesus said give you just give no 
He told you what to give. If he's hungry, give him food. If he's thirsty, give him drink. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading to you from verse 6. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Now, here are the words of Jesus Christ himself. And you know, sometimes when you read the Bible, you have to balance up everything. You, you have to understand what the Bible is really saying. Otherwise, you will go and you will go back home. You'll go to your community. And then you'll be giving out some things. Some people will say, what? Why are you doing this? That's what they taught us in the church. Love your enemies and give. Then you bring up the man is saying that you know, uh, Mr. So and so, you, you know, I'm so hard up now and I need this. And uh, you know, the and then you say, I don't have anything, just my only tithe and offering that I'm taking to church next Sunday. That's the only thing I have now. Uh, I'm suffering. Okay, Jesus said, Give. Then you bring your tithe and offering, you give your enemy. Then when you come on Sunday, you want to offer your tithe to the Lord, raise it up, you drop your hand. And then people are looking at you. What happened to you? I gave my enemy my tithe and offering. No. Give not that which is holy unto dogs. You have to balance up everything. The school fees of your children. You cannot give that to your enemy. You're going to pay your school. You're going to pay school fees. Your rent. You cannot give that to your enemy. You have to preserve your rent. It's not just to give and give and give. If he's hungry, you have food, you give him. If he's thirsty, you have water, you give him water to drink. But give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your peers before, the, before swine. Lest they trample them under their feet and, and turn again and rent you. You cannot give holy things, precious things, valuable things, eternal things. Things, they don't know the value of that. You're not going to give them that. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages for them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son. Nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Those of us who are, you know, old time Christians, mature Christians, I'm sure you know this. But we need to teach this because of our new converts. You will not say, well, because Jesus said give, and then your daughter now, you know, an enemy is coming, and then you have been saying, no, no, no. Now you came to Bible study for these three weeks, and you have to love your enemies, and you have to give unto your enemies. And then they, those enemies, they are watching. They are trying to monitor what we are studying. And then the very day we study, love your enemies and give unto them. As you get back home, you know, the fellow comes back again. And he says, I still come to plead. This is your daughter. You know, even though we know that we are not in the same religion. And we know that it's like we hate, you know, what you have been practicing. But at least, why don't you love your enemy and give this your daughter? daughter to us and then you remember okay love your enemies and give and then you say busy come these people are saying that they want to marry you and then you give your daughter to an enemy and then when we hear that in the church we discipline you you say, I, I'm obeying the Bible they taught us in the church and see what the church has done. And they disciplined me. No, you are not obeying the Bible. We need to understand everything. Do you understand? I know you understand. In Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 5. And that because of false brethren unawares brought him who came in to, uh, to spy, privilege to spy out our liberty that we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. It is talking about false prophets. They wanted Paul the apostle to give them chance, give them opportunity give them liberty to preach their false doctrine to the church 
where Paul was ministering. And Paul, the apostle, said, no, not for an hour. We never gave them a single chance. We're not to give the enemies of the gospel chance to come and preach false doctrine in our church. We can give them water to drink. We can give them food to eat. We can lend them little amount of money if we have. We can give them material things, but not to take the precious things of the word, the pulpit of the church, and give to the enemy. We have to moderate and limit everything by the word of God. In um, First Kings chapter 21. First Kings chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 2. And he hath spake unto neighbors, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I, may, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it, I will give, I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And neighbor said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid it me, that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Know your inheritance. Know what you possess. I know what the Lord has specially given you. Spiritual heritage that the Lord has given you. You're not going to take that and dump in the bosom of an enemy. God forbid that I will take the inheritance from my fathers, the heritage of a child of God and give that to the enemy. Never. And so if they are thirsty, we'll give them water to drink. If they are hungry, we'll give them food to eat. More than that, spiritual things were very, very watchful. Let us come now to point number three. Perfection of love in Christians. Perfection of love in Christians. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Be ye therefore the word therefore relates that verse to the preceding verses. That means it's calling us to perfection in love. It's not perfection in knowledge. Be ye therefore perfect as your father which is in heaven is perfect. He is perfect in knowledge. We can never be perfect in knowledge. He's perfect in power. We can never be perfect in power. He is perfect in wisdom. We can never be perfect in wisdom. But love and mercy kindness, compassion, understanding one another, being compassionate, be therefore perfect in love, perfect in mercy. When there is any doubt, should I, should I not go on the side of mercy? Should I, should I not go on the side of love? Should I, should I not go on the side of kindness? That's the perfection we're talking about. Be perfect in love. And then as you do that, then you will realize that more and more, the nature of God is being revealed more in your life. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. You see what is to be perfected? The love of God. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. That's how to live as he walked. Perfection of love. And if you're going to be perfect in anything, you'll practice it. Didn't you hear in school? Practice makes perfect. But if you never practice, you know, if you if you have ever played any game in your life, you know, the first time you start playing the game, it looks awkward. Whether it's table tennis or it's uh, football or whatever, when you are very young, you will not be able to coordinate very well. But you did it every day, every day, every day. And you look for a chance to play that game every day. And it's because you're looking for chance, looking for chance, looking for chance to do it. 
Because, you know, just any little yard, any little open space, you begin to play football. And then at the back somewhere, you begin to play football. And you carry it about all the time. And then by, by the time you've done it over and over and over, it becomes almost natural, almost second nature. The same thing with love. You'll practice it. If you know that your tendency is that whenever you know some people have done something you don't appreciate, you're always, you know, quiet and reserved. And you know, you're just by yourself. Brother, any problem? No, no, I just, you know, I just love quietness. But you are not as quiet like that yesterday. Why are you so quiet today? Practice love. Oppose yourself. Contradict yourself. And the way you have been doing things, just pinch yourself and say, no, I must love. Practice it. And it is when you seek for chance, opportunity to go out of yourself and to practice it by doing it over and over and over. The love of God is perfected in you. Husband and wife, we're not talking about enemies now. Even husband and wife, study yourselves. Whenever something happens, you know the way you always react. Everything is dead quiet. No noise, no sound, no talking, no discussion, no laughter. You know, everybody goes gently. It's good to be gentle, but this gentleness is this one is another thing. This one is inconvenient. And then we look at one another, it's like, you know, we don't like to see one another. You know, in the same house, you pass this way, the other one goes this way. If that has been the habit, every time something happens, then that tendency will come again. Check yourself immediately and say, no, I will practice. You practice the opposite. You love. And it is when you do that, eventually it will become part of you. It will become your, your real pattern of life. That's how we change habit. That's how we change the things that are not right. Look at First John chapter 4, verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. And his love is perfected in us. It will be done. In verse 17, herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment because I see it, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. God will protect anyone that has love because God is love. There's nothing for you to fear. Oh, if I love, they'll, they'll take advantage of me. It will be as I'm honey, they'll suck me up. It will be like I'm sugar, they're just going to lick me up. They're going to take advantage of me if I become soft. Don't worry about that. There's no fear in love. You know, that's why some people, that's why some people don't want to change. They feel that, no, I want them to respect me, to have some regard for me. If I, you know, become so cheerful and so loving and so compassionate, and they'll forget my position, who I am, and then they will not relate to me the way they ought to relate to me. Don't worry about that. There's no fear in love. Perfect love can set out fear. And then he tells us, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. If you fear that if I really love, they'll take advantage of me. This is what they, you are, that's suspicion. You're just making some conclusions with your imagination. And those things are not true. Let go and let God. God will help us. And then we're told in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. Above all these things put on charity, which is the perfect, which is the bond of perfectness. We're told in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 verse 40. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. That's all the Lord is asking of us, just to be like Jesus. Every time something happens, ask yourself, what will Jesus do? If somebody makes a mistake, and then that mistake happens to accidentally hurt you. 
What will Jesus do? Practice what Jesus will do. Because every disciple that is aiming towards perfection will be aiming to becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ. And since the Lord lives within us, he will live his life in us. We're told in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Reading from verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. That's a secret. My self-interest is crucified with Christ. That's a secret. My demand for attention for myself is crucified with Christ. That's a secret. You know, we're not able to love when we're thinking about ourselves, our honor, our respect, our personality, our right, our pleasure. We want to protect ourselves. Let that go. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Let Christ live in you. Let Christ live in us. When that happens, then it says, and then the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. With this, we can love one another. We can love our enemies. We can love everybody. Can we do it? We'll begin to do it even from tonight. Let's rise up and let's talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord will help us. That this love, God will help us to show it. When you catch yourself making a mistake and going back to what you used to do, Pinch yourself and say, no, you can't do that again. When you discover yourself that you want to act like you used to do, be unhappy, be sad. Again, somebody that, that is hurting you, when it appears that you want to react like the way you used to do, pinch yourself and say, no, I can't do that again. Now I'm crucified with Christ. Now self is crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. Tell the Lord, he'll help you. When he lives within us, his grace will live within us. His love will live big within us. His compassion will expand within us. His kindness will grow within us. Love your enemies. Think about them. Think about them. Imagine what you're going to do now. How are you going to obey the commandments of Christ? We're not talking about enemies of righteousness. We're not talking about occultic people. We're not talking about sorcerers with dark powers. We're just talking about enemies, personal enemies that hate you insult you, offend you, hurt you. And the Lord is specific, very clear as to what we can give them. The food and the water and the material things. You are not giving them your soul. You're not giving them a covenant. You're not making a covenant with the enemy. You're just giving them water to drink and food to eat and clothes to wear and material things to help them. You're not getting into any marriage agreement with them or with their parents or with their, or with their children. Just give them water to drink and food to eat. And lend them if you have. But 
balance up the word of God. No hatred in the heart of a child of God. No malice in the heart of a child of God. No plan to do evil in the heart of a child of God. No plan to retaliate to revenge in the heart of a child of God. Love perfected. Because love is practiced constantly, regularly. Love your enemies. We are not hearers only, we are doers of the world. Look for chance every day to do it. Look for an opportunity every day to do it. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. And if there are people you are not in talking terms with, the Lord is asking you to go back home and rectify that relationship. There are people you have been holding grudge against. Even the mention of their names irritates you, annoy you. Or the sound of their voice bothers you. Get on your knees. Get that kind of thing out of your heart. Remember, this is an item that will come on the judgment day on the final exam. This affects life eternal. This affects life beyond the grave you don't want to die with hatred in your heart you don't want to die with malice, grudge revenge retaliation in your heart purge it out You see, such kind of hatred, such kind of attitude, such kind of disposition will destroy every other thing you have, every other thing you do in life. It spoils your service. It corrupts your commitment. Whatever else you do, whatever else you give in the house of God, if you exchange hatred for hatred, evil for evil, malice for malice, slander for slander, curse for curse your service will not be accepted in the sight of the Lord when you do evil you do good when they hate you love When they curse, 
you bless. That the love of God shine forth through you. Live your life on the basis of principle, not on the basis of emotion, not on the basis of feeling. Live your life on the basis of principle. The Lord has commanded, this is what you do. When you make up your mind, that's what I will do. That's principle. Whether you feel like it or you don't feel like it. Whatever the Lord has commanded, that is what to do. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Then will you resemble your father who is in heaven. Be ye therefore merciful as your father who is in heaven is merciful. Be therefore kind and compassionate. As your Father who is in heaven is kind and compassionate. Be ye therefore forgiving. As your Father who is in heaven is forgiving. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. The grace of God is available and it's yours for the claiming and you can say Lord thank you you're forgiving my sin you've saved me I'm a child of God Christ lives on the inside of me and because of that I will allow Christ to live through me Let self be crucified. And let your love go beyond the love of the scribes and the Pharisees. Love imputed unto you, imparted unto you from God himself when such love is in you to change you transform you and your neighbors will see your neighbors will know your neighbors will take note of it That truly you are being with Christ.
God accepts others. He's helping others. Yield yourself to the Lord. Let him help you too.